Bonjour à ceux qui sont dans l'amphi euh, Robert Cassel à, dans le bâtiment Germaine Tillion de l'EHESP, mais bonjour aussi à ceux qui sont à distance, car il y a aussi des gens à distance, donc on est en comodal. Euh, et euh, on a le plaisir euh, d'accueillir euh, aujourd'hui euh, Lourdes Canteraro Arevalo, pardon, moi je la connais sous le nom de Lou, voilà. Et elle est professeure associée euh, à l'Université de Copenhague au Danemark, où elle travaille dans un groupe de recherche de pharma pharmacie sociale et clinique. Donc, je vais maintenant faire la même introduction, mais euh, un petit peu différente, mais en anglais, parce que nous avons ici des étudiants du, euh, de Europe of Health. So, Lou is an associated professor at the Faculty of Health and Medical Science at, in, at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. She's a member of the scientific committee of the Child and Adolescent Health section of the UFA, where I belong to, that is a public health association. And um, in 2008, she graduated from Europe of Health. So that's for you guys, students from Europe of Health a nice uh, incentive to, to, to keep on working. Uh, so, so now she will give her presentation in English, despite the fact that the title is in French. But when we will have the, the, the question session after uh, 40 minutes of presentation, we will take the question either in English or in French. And she can answer either in English or in French. Okay, all set? Good. Merci beaucoup, Emmanuel. Thank you, Emmanuel. And Emmanuel forgot to say that we have published very recently a call for action because we really need to do something about uh, preparing healthcare services and the society in general to really take care of our adolescents. Bienvenue pour ceux qui sont en ligne. Uh, je parle français. Je peux prendre des questions en français et, et je serai ravi de vous uh, répondre. Mais on va y aller et je vais le faire en anglais. So, there we go. So, the topic of my presentation today, it's titled Advancing Adolescent Public Mental Health. I will be focusing on mental health through youth-driven interventions. And part of my role as a member of the University of Copenhagen, a little disclaimer, these are my thoughts, my opinions, my views, my experiences. I am not representing the university or any affiliated organization to the University of Copenhagen in this regard. So the uh, content of the presentation, I will go through the theoretical pillars of youth-led interventions first, then briefly current state of adolescent mental health, and I will give some statistics on how is it going uh, throughout the world. So these are uh, worldwide uh, data. The challenges of traditional mental health interventions, and I will name some, but I'm sure that in the questions and answer, you will help me to see more. And I'm actually very looking forward to that session, the questions and answer, because I know, because I've been talking to you, that I can learn a lot from you. So questions, but comments, recommendations, ideas are very welcome. I will briefly describe the concept of youth-driven interventions, some examples, my examples, and some examples that I've come across, not necessarily mine, and then finally, uh, key components and conclusions. So this is it. So pillar number one, uh, I would like to start by saying this sentence is not my sentence. It's a sentence of a young uh, person I work with or I work for, um, Andrew, 21, he came together with another one to UFA, the conference in Berlin two years ago, and he had to present the project that we have uh, in common. And when I, he was quite nervous, and when I asked him, so how did it go? He said, it was okay. I am demystifying academia. And I thought, huh, it's very interesting. So he was mystifying academia in the first place. Is what is it with academia, right? And we often talk about this ivory tower where we are in these beautiful places, a bit away from the community, working with our computers, doing our studies. And sometimes people around 
are around us, they don't really know what we are doing. Huh? So my first point is, let us open science to citizens in a very participatory way. Some of you might have heard of citizen science. It's a way of doing science that actually is not coming from the health research field, it's coming from uh, environmental sciences, and it started long back. But one of the examples that I find very beautiful is that you have these butterflies going from or flying from Mexico to Canada, the monarch butterflies, and we discover their migration routes because of citizens sending data, so entry points throughout the hold. And they would send this data to the principal investigator who finally makes sense of all this data. Beautiful discoveries in, in, in the environmental field has been done with citizen sciences about fungi, birds, insects, wonderful. So the uh, strength of this approach is that it's really working with amateur scientists, but many, so many data entries. And what I mm, don't like about this approach is that it's a bit just limiting to data collection. And now it is the same in health research. We have the 23andMe and other projects, data collection. What I also think it's important is to combine it with particip participatory action research. So more active engagement of, in my case, young people. And this is coming from the 70s. If Natalia from Brazil is here, Paulo Freire and the pedagogy of the oppressed. So um, giving people a voice, listening to their needs, making space. The way I combine the two is actually uh, going for a lot of data, but involving a group of uh, adolescents we work with throughout the whole circle of the research um, uh, cycle, right? So from defining the research question and then define the research question, I am not defining the research question, they collaborate in gathering data, in recruiting, and also in analyzing data. And that of course, and we will talk about it later, includes or implies that we have to train them in how to analyze data, if they want to. This is an invitation. It's, I'm always very uh, open to uh, the participants to say you would participate according to your preferences. It's not that you have to go through all the stages. And some young people, they really don't like to analyze data. And some young people, they don't care about our, uh, scientific publications. So we have to adapt to that. This is what I think it's a democratic approach to generate science. And uh, this is the way I go when it comes to working with young people and, and designing interventions. The second pillar is decolonizing evidence. I'm sure many of you have seen this pyramid at least through the master, at least twice. And on top, we know that we have the meta analysis and systematic review of RCTs. We could use an hour to discuss selection bias in RCTs, but we are not gonna do that now. But so much to say that in our field, this is the top of the notch, la creme de la creme of data. However, I have another pyramid that I would like to share with you. And this, if I may. So, alo, 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 alo. how can I show my other pyramid? Oh, there we go, my pyramid. So the other one is like pointing at explicit and tacit knowledge. And explicit knowledge, we all know what it is, is the knowledge gathered or gained through health research, health data, is um, found in documents, articles, IT is essential to transfer the knowledge, but we have a huge amount of knowledge called the tacit knowledge that it's very much linked to intuitive knowledge, know-hows, perspectives, views, experiences, that I, in the research that I do, working with adolescents, I think this is key, right? And it goes also as well for policymakers, but I will focus on citizen knowledge, and especially young citizens' knowledge. Aziz. And 
I'm very happy to see that the WHO is really on board with this. So they are developing a series of documents and uh, organizing seminars or citizen engagement in, in, the, in this case, in evidence-informed policymaking. And they have these guides to mini public. So how to do it, how to engage citizens in these processes. Now, these mini, uh, these mini publics, when it comes to adolescents, are a bit challenging. So I think I will propose to them that they have to adapt it to young people. Let's see if they hear me. Pillar number three, deconstruction adolescent mental health. And I think that we've discovered this with the student uh, or discuss it uh, with you before, but I would like to question, should we really fix the individual or should we fix the collective denial of what's around the individual, the social economic conditions, the commercial determinants of health, the environmental degradation of the planet? What is that we need to fix? And I would go that in adolescent mental health, there has been for a long time, a tyranny of building individual resilience. So pull yourself together, be resilient. It's, it's like, um, well, I, I'm not sure is that easy being a young somebody with all these layers of confusion and threats to really leave it uh, up to them to be resilient. So there are a couple of books that are coming from the 70s, actually. This is nothing new. Uh, the first one was published in 71, The Limits of Growth, and it was commissioned by a think tank called the, the um, Club of Rome. And already 50, Two years ago, these two uh, uh, scholars were talking about, we cannot grow forever. Resources are finite. And we have population growing. And the Earth, is there is no planet B. This is what we have. So already 50 years ago. The other document that I think is quite relevant with deconstruction adolescent mental health is this uh, um, medical nemesis from Ivan Illich that I really would like to recommend to you. And he was a philosopher, a priest, a theologian from uh, Vienna. And these two documents also published, this, this was published in, in 1973, are two groundbreaking documents that I think, or books that I think that are really worth reading. He's talking about, are we sure that our healthcare systems are doing more good than harm? And he borrowed from a nurse from England, Florence Nightingale, the idea of jatrogenic. So the, the fact that we actually can cause harm with our healthcare systems. And we will see it when a case later when it's about adolescent health, but we should really be careful about this. Now, the third block talking about deconstruction adolescent health is this very recent book called The Myth of Normal, published by is a synthesis of evidence, scientific evidence. It took him, this Dr. Gabor Mate, 10 years to gather all this evidence. And it is really pointing out how can we be normal in a toxic culture? How can we ask adolescent people to be normal and to thrive when the culture around is toxic? And this, what this, the beauty of this book, well, this doctor, you really have to just Google him, you will see it's amazing. Well, his point in this like these are new paradigms that consider the connection health, minds, and socio-political context. And the beauty of this evidence is that these are cohort studies, all these bio, biostats, AP studies that we are so happy for, showing how it actually works. The pathways. So it's not really something abstract, it's really getting under our skin, right? So what is that we have to fix? The individual or the toxic culture? I would go for B, but you know my preference. Very recent article this month, uh, I follow the uh, Lancet, Planetary Health, and I think that is also very interesting. There are some articles really um, studying this connection. So this one is emotional responses and psychological health among young people amid climate change. Fukushima's radioactive water in the Pacific Ocean, war in Ukraine and the Middle East, and the mediating role of media uh, exposure and nature connectedness. Beautiful study, and it's a multi-country study, and I really would recommend reading it, especially for those of you who are into EPI. So what do we have here? So we, ha we have 
climate change and how the different uh, young participants really point the different emotions. We have here radioactive water release in the Pacific Ocean, and then we have war. And then in this sort of spider web, we have the different emotions. So actually it's interesting to see that across China, the UK, USA, South Africa, and Portugal, young people react more or less in the same way. With disappointment pointing, with being interested, but also sadness, also a sense of helplessness. Now the thing with radioactive waters is quite interesting because of course the blue line here is China. Of course, it makes sense that they are disappointed and angry and disgusted and outraged because it's really outside uh, their door, right? Where the, the other countries are like affected, but not as, as much. And then we have here wars with uh, also many of the participants really assessing it in the same way, concern and sad. And it's, this is actually a very high level of concern. So we go for little too much. Um, I'm very happy to see these kind of studies because really we can show that there is a reason why some adolescents are really not thriving and that they are really struggling. So to sum up the three pillars, um, what I really like to do with my research is to facilitate these participatory approaches. Uh, what is being called Youth Participatory Action Research Point Two. So both gathering this participatory approach plus gathering a lot of data. Then we have the youth uh, citizen knowledge and the idea of valuing, echoing it, doing something with it. And then we have, as we uh, saw the first day that we were talking together, is addressing not only the individual, but the digital factors, and these are the SDGs. Okay, so that's the uh, three theoretical pillars. And let's go for the current state of adolescent health, mental health uh, throughout the globe. And it's really not looking good. So one in seven uh, from 10 to 19 experience a mental health disorder and accounting for 30% of the global burden, depression, anxiety, and behavioral disorders are the most common ones, ADHD, eating disorders. Uh, suicide is the fourth uh, leading cause of death in the group from 15 to 29. And this is really something that is worrying us all. In 2019, it was estimated that around 160 million young people were suffering from a mental disorder, more young boys than women. And of course, the pandemic was not really helping um, the, the prevalence really double when it comes to depression and anxiety disorders. So this uh, mental health crisis among youth, a worldwide problem, really need radical and innovative solutions. And uh, the thing with academia sometimes is that we are good and thorough, but we are a bit slow. Our studies take time. Youth moves faster, and we really need to embrace that. I also wanted to show you that there is this journal, uh, this article in the Journal of Adolescent Health showing that even among young representatives about the topics that are priority number one, mental health is a priority for, for them, is priority number one among other problems, other healthcare problems. Mm -hmm. So it's echoing once more their, their, uh, their needs and their priorities. So ad ad addressing mental health is, is, a, is a top one for them as well. So what can we do and how can we go about this? So we have the determinants, socioeconomic determinants, family, of course, but school peers. We have the environment, environmental degradation, inequalities. And we have, as Juan Carlos mentioned it very nicely the first day, the commercial determinants. We can design intervention upstream, trying to change structural and system level changes through regulations or law or court decisions. We can go midstream, community level, seeking to address, address the exposure to hazards or addressing uh, health risk behaviors, or we can go downstream, going to the micro level, the individual level, and the efforts to increase access and use of healthcare services. Now, the bulk of what we do uh, until now is this. 
my contribution is really to try to go up to this. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not yet into um, upstream interventions, but I will show you a couple of them led by, by young people that I think they are pretty, pretty interesting. So going back to the challenges of traditional mental health interventions. So the problem with these interventions sometimes, this is based on evidence, uh, it's that um, they are not really aligned with your youth priorities. For example, when it comes to uh, professional priorities, it's really going at tackling healthcare outcomes or health outcomes, re reducing suicide. From a young perspective is building community, sense of belonging, support among others. Um, so if we want them to, to really uh, embrace interventions, we really need to also respond to their priorities. Another problem is, of course, limit understanding and emphasis on micro level. Again, fixing the individual and not the condition affecting the individual. And the, the individual. Different communication styles. And this is, of course, super important. One of the things that I have experienced and that the young people were telling us is that, okay, you have this meeting with professors and experts. And the thing, the first thing they do is, hi, my name is Lourdes. I'm an associate professor at the faculty that creates a barrier like immediately. It's like, I just, I'm just 19. I have not finished anything. I just have my name. So can we just call each other by our names and stop there instead of all this? So be careful because you are there, right? You are highly educated, you're professionals. And for some of you, that could be an issue, right? So all this glass uh, between people. Um, little focus on empowerment and ownership. And this is not easy. I mean, I've been already trying to um, move this field forward three, three years, and sometimes the respect is so strong. And even, even if I try to be um, Lou, well, I am not Lou, I am a, I'm a, I'm an academic, right? So, so this, this of empowering sometimes, it's, it's really complicated. Um, something that I really think it's important, and some of you have addressed that, is uh, neglect of cultural relevance. I am a Western white woman, and I have a blind bias. And even though I think that I don't have it, I have it. And if you want to take a test about unconscious bias, go in the net and take it. It is very enlightening. We all have bias, and it's important to recognize that. Low adaptability and innovation, the rigidity of the academic system is what it is, and it has to be this way. We need to provide evidence. I really like evidence. But youth have other ways of moving, have other ways of solving problems, and I will show you a couple of them. Uh, peer influence, design, uh, interventions designed by peers echo way better than interventions designed by adults, and that's also proven. And then lack of feedback and interaction. There is something that we really need to work a lot of this with in the projects I work with, really feeding back, this is what we've learned, what you think about it, uh, embracing all kinds of discussions because we talk about youth, but youth is um, many youths. So uh, embracing all users is, is, is key as well. Quickly, the definition. So there are programs, initiatives, strategies uh, led by young people. And they go from the design, the implementation, and the evaluation, of course. And I think they are very, very uh, useful to promote empowering, foster inclusivity, and actually creating sustainable solutions in the field of adolescent health. So this is where we are pointing at. This is levels of engagement. And of course, there are many uh, projects informing or consulting or involving all the participatory research does that but we want to go a bit further in the, in the scale. We want to either co-lead or allow young people to lead interventions. The benefits, well, we increase engagement, relevance, empowerment, peer support, and reduce the stigma. This is quite important, actually. And even though I'm in love with this approach, I think that I need to stay center and objective. There are a lot of risks as well. Right, so we need to acknowledge the lack of professional oversight sometimes, and um, this is a, a, an issue. Unsafe disclosure, um, we need to make sure that we create safe spaces for, uh, for young people to 
to share if they want to share. Inadequate resources, as Igor uh, shared with you during his talk, is like I cannot really submit application for funding. What I say is like they will decide. <laughs> And it's like, what about the logical framework? What about the culture? It's like, well, let's see what they are prioritizing. It is really not very family friendly. Emotional toll is often in happening that those youth um, members who want to involve are always the same and they are very active. And what I really would like and my struggle right now, uh, it is to really embrace diversity. Not as a way of tokenism or diversity washing or whatever, but I think there is such a potential into really embracing everybody. Different socioeconomic um, levels, um, different interests, different way of viewing life. Sometimes youth representatives have um, quite limited view of things, uh, not always, but they, it can, and of course, confidentiality and ethical considerations. So here comes some examples of youth-led interventions. This is upstream interventions dealing with commercial determinants of health. This is a, a group of young people who created this platform dealing with uh, food, the food industry, Bite Back. How cool is that name? Um, and what they're trying to do is to really sort of uh, advocate for uh, proper food industry and really disclosing what's behind all these things that we are eating and we are not supposed to eat. So I thought it was kind of cool. The other one is True Initiative. This one is from the UK. This one is from the US. And they are really very much into, I think I have to read this loud because it's so beautiful. We believe each individual has the right to live in a world free from tobacco and nicotine dependence, tobacco related death and disease and the devastating dollar cost to individuals and the society. We speak, seek, and spread the truth about smoking. And it's, it's purely led by them. And it really addresses commercial determinants of health. I thought that some of you were interested in these commercial determinants of health. And I think these are beautiful initiatives. Now we have a, a big um, forum. Are, are you aware of One Young World? Yeah? Great. Um, so. By the way, it's in Montreal in September, the conference. Is anybody attending? No? I would like to attend. I'm not young any longer, but anyway. <laughs> Crazy stuff what they are doing this. And then I would like to share with you. I need to share any technicians here attending my, because I need to share this video of one of the youth ambassador. Let's see how it goes. It's always the same with videos, right? We want to share videos with you, and it's always a bit problematic. So that's this. this yeah, picture? yeah, that's the link. Yeah, if you press. By the way, it is. Yeah, I hope um, it's okay. It's a bit sensitive when it comes to the topic is uh, is mental health, of course. So she's sharing some uh, sensitive insights. Hmm. Il ne peut pas venir le... Well, otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
lost in understanding of well-being. Mental health professionals didn't look like me or understood where I came from. My culture was either ignored, stereotyped, or unfairly blamed for my mental health challenges. After struggling for so long, I started working in mental health advocacy, and it was then that I realized that my experiences were far from uncommon. I've met many multicultural people who share similarly complex lived experiences, trying to seek support in mental health systems that are culturally unresponsive and culturally unsafe. My journey as an advocate started with storytelling. I've since been privileged to work across the mental health sector as a board director, policy advisor, peer worker, keynote speaker, and more. But no matter where I looked, one thing was consistently missing, a genuine understanding of multicultural mental health. In response, this year, I founded Multicultural Minds, a storytelling platform dedicated to raising awareness of multicultural mental health. I created a safe space where we as multicultural people can each speak for ourselves, share our stories, and drive tangible change. We started off as a very small podcast, but now we are co-writing a book. Our book currently includes the stories of over 300 multicultural people from over 150 different cultures. Each story is so complex and so unique. Some have been shared in writing, some in audio, and some with art. There is Phoebe, a young Singaporean girl who struggled with eating disorders as a child, but now works as a mental health clinician who is changing things for kids just like her. There is Ollie, an Australian <coughs> Aboriginal man who has reclaimed his connection to country and believes that decolonizing mental health policies is the key to creating change. And then there is Buddy an Indonesian, non-binary, gay and Muslim person who speaks and celebrates the importance of intersectional mental health. Our book will be released early next year and will be shared widely with multicultural communities, mental health organizations, decision makers, and so much more. One Young World, we have an invaluable opportunity to raise awareness of multicultural mental health. I invite you to share your story with us. No matter who you are or where you come from, your story can change things for the better. Help us make mental health a priority for everyone. Thank you. If I speak 30 seconds? No. Okay. Um, um, I, I will describe one of yes, that's uh, So, um, actually, I'm just starting with the field order project of the main project uh, with uh, young people in the mental conditions. In, and so, I'll uh, that for you as Why don't we investigate? Thank you. Why don't we investigate uh, what's going on with them? Because one of the things that they said is that we don't feel safe at school, and we are talking about Denmark, and this is 2024. So what they did is actually to engage uh, with their networks of networks and run interviews, observations. They did ad work with uh, uh, LGBTQ plus um, children from school. And this is data from Denmark. This is 
Stop Discrimination and School is a survey conducted among LGBT students. And in Denmark, on average, there is one to two person LGBT per class. 30% of them feel lonely or very lonely at school. 64% have suicidal thoughts. 53% have committed self-harm. 40% suffer from eating disorders. And 36% does not, do not talk about their sexual orientation or, or gender identity at school. So we really want to change this. Um, and the uh, young people within our uh, research team, they started this project. Technology is not my real friend today. I rather... Na, 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 na. There we go. Okay, so some insights into the sharings of, of, of um, children because it goes until 15 years old. So they are really early adolescents. So this one of the issues that they receive is just by chance to find someone who knows about your disease or condition and your sexual orientation and gender identity. If I could change anything at school today, I would be clear to change the students' curriculum and teaching material. And this, I thought it was beautiful. Um, when I was in elementary school, there was no mention of gay, bi, or pansexuality at all, which led you to, as an LGBTQ plus student, being alienated and you were alone with your problems. So um, that's, that's, I think, something that, of course, we want teaching material where everybody feels reflected. It has to resonate with everybody right? Embracing diversity. Denmark, by the way, is a very homogeneous country. It's a very little country, but so, so what? Uh, it has to be done. It's hard work as a young person to educate adults, and this is, of course, a, a big issue. My school days have been confusing despite a sense of school's acceptance. I experience a lot of hygge transphobia. There is this work in Danish, hygge. It's a sort of coziness, and he's in this, like, there is a lot of transphobia kind of hygge, kind of cozy. Even if you reach out for help, the adults were not active enough. They were also asking for flexibility. When you live with a condition, you really need sometimes to, to stay at home. And they were saying, it's like, well, we stayed at home during the pandemic. Why is that we cannot stay at home now? That was also an issue raised. And then there are issues related to uh, make it school safer, there was for many uh, a very um, good thing to move to the main city, to Copenhagen. The rural areas were kind of uh, intense for some of them. And they also uh, raised the issue of more understanding about neuroqueer and neurodivergence. So they came up with a proposal and we're still trying to discuss with schools how to make this happen. And they are developing an advocacy uh, campaign through Instagram that I think is quite exciting. So, number one, update mainstream learning materials. Let's see how it goes. We will push for that. Show healthy curiosity. They, they, they are open to receive questions from, from everybody, but just not too inquisitive and, 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 and in a way, in a healthy way, right? Allow for flipped classrooms, just like during COVID, because for them, sometimes when they have to take their meds or when they have a bad day, it's, they can follow online if they could, but now it's not allowed any longer. Um, half separate neutral change in rooms, bathrooms. The bathroom issue is a big issue uh, for some, and there are not neutral places or places they can go to. Um, respect for change of names and pronouns. Create safe private spaces when they have to take their medications. Um, uh, permit higher absenteeism rates for those living with uh, chronic conditions, severe chronic conditions, or for those needing uh, to take their hormone treatments and allow for more breaks, slow versions of the pensum so that they can follow because what we see is that they just quit school and that's really a big issue. So we can really make it easier for them. And then finally show respect for these invisible diseases. Mental health is an invisible condition. It's like you don't, you don't see it, right? And many people have really a lot of prejudices like, come on, how sick you can be? You look good from the outside. 
and from uh, fluid sogis and neurodiversity. I had other two projects, but I think that I will stop here and I will open the uh, room for sharings and, and questions and also for those online. Thank you. Um, this, um, my question is, how do you, like, for example, it says, how do you show respect for the um, invisible diseases, but for some universities or places, you need, like, certificates, right? And how does that integrate with a multicultural um, approach, you know, because each country is going to define a disability or a neurodiversity different from each context, you know, so I don't know if your experience is better to standardize these procedures or adapt them, like, how does that work? So how to embrace diversity of, of certificates? That it... So you're talking about um, when some, di some diseases are invisible, right? Yeah. So for them to be visible, you mostly will need a certificate that validates your disease. Oh, you like know? a diagnosis. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. each diagnosis will change depending on the country of the standards. And that's like one thing. But the other, you were talking about multicultural integration of mental health. So that is going to change from place country to place. To country to country. That's a very good point. Yeah, Alessia, thank you. So the way we do it in Denmark, you get a reassessment. So if you come from a country and you say, it's like, I live with um, anxiety, you will be assessed by a Danish doctor. So we want the national filter in place. That's the way it works. Now, what doesn't mean that students or professors, they can advocate for a change. But I am describing how it works right now. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Lou. I think <clears throat> it was super interesting. And um, it, I, when, when you were talking about how to include adolescents, I have like a comment and a question for you because it reminded me, yeah, it reminded me uh, to the theme of this uh, year's Mental Health Week, European Mental Health Week, that was about co-creation, right? So it's about how to include uh, the people that we work for in the whole process. And um, since you were providing resources, I also wanted to mention that Mental Health Europe has like a toolkit uh, for co-creation. And I think it's, it's very like in detail and it provides a lot of information on how to include people that we are going to work for. And they also Thank mentioned you, like this uh, part that you said, uh, all the benefits that including the people uh, bring, but also they talk about like how it's actually also working through like a human rights approach, because it is a right that you are part of uh, the interventions and the policies that are gonna be targeting you, right? Um, and my question now with this is like, in your case, how do you, how does this work? process work in practice? Like, how do you gather all this information? How do you gather the adolescents? And um, how do you ensure that they feel safe as well? And that their mental health is also protected? Because I think that's also an important part, right? Like, they're going to become vulnerable. And how do you ensure that their mental health is um, yeah, protected or they have this kind of support? Yes. Thank you, Aida. Uh, yes, you have a very good point. Is this 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 approach of doing science and developing interventions, it's not only about pragmatic approaches, it works better. It is based on ethical standpoints. I mean, and that's, that's a very good point. I can tell you what I did. So with colleagues from the University of Copenhagen, we, we, I just saw a book that was 25 stories of people living with mental uh, conditions. And then I read it and then I contacted them. It's like, I really would like to get to know you and I'm, I'm doing research in the field, but would you like to be interested in doing research with us? And it's, it took us, it's been three years now that we work with them. It took us like six months to create trust. But of course, why should they open to us 
and why should they trust us? So a lot of meetings and a lot of sharings and they have a lot of questions and what is it that you want from us and so on. Then we selected seven or actually they selected themselves and they are part of the core team. So they are this young citizen scientists and they, um, they set up the agenda a lot of brainstormings, a lot of methods that some of you are using with the innovation tool. So uh, they defined 10 topics they wanted to address. One was navigating the system. The other one was uh, actually relationships, uh, intimate relationships. Another one was invisibility of their condition, issues with uh, money, because still even in Denmark, some of them have to co-pay for their medication. So 10, th 10 themes. And what we Do afterwards and the networks or the networks we're starting a system that is actually not ours it's from the university of michigan a project called my voice where you gather data through texting so every week the big plat the, the network of networks they receive questions and they can send whatever they want they can send an audio file a video a text and it's participatory it's, well it's not participatory it's actually qualitative research so it's just a lot of words and from there, we discovered this issue with the LGBTQ young people. And what it's, we have analyzed the data, we are writing an article. My thing is that the young citizen scientists, they have to be co-authors. My problem now is that I don't give, they don't give a damn about articles. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a standby article. What they really care is about actions and changing policies and going for advocacy. And my problem now is that I don't have the money to support them there because they are paid. They were paid when they went to UFA. They are paid when they participate in data analysis and the network of networks, they also receive some payment because I think it's only fair. So that's my experience in, in brief. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, well, thank you, Lou, for your insights and for sharing the case of Denmark. Um, in this case, we are talking about a developing country that faces different uh, mental health issues. And I would like to know more about your insights and maybe uh, other cases you know about lower income countries, especially countries where adolescents are facing uh, violence as well. And where to apply, like what you mentioned, Palos Verde's theory of the oppressed, we don't only involve adolescents but their families and this action is more about society action and how can we get there for a better mental health of adolescents. That's of course such a great point thank you of course and well I'm just this little Lou working in the little Denmark <laughs> but there is a huge world out there of many people doing beautiful things when it comes to mental health and actually um, there is again through one world Young people um, in countries like Iran, with all the um, huge uh, refugees, they, they are actually initiating actions, NGOs, to help people in, in refugee camps. And this is actions undertaken by young people. Really, it's not... Um, this, these young leaders is not to be underestimated. I would like to share more videos with you but they are really doing actions to provide food in refugee camps, um, psychological help, family help, because we are, of course, especially for, for younger, young people, it is really important to address the, the community. Um, yeah, that I would like to share for you, uh, with you for now, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, you, you know oh, yeah. how it goes? Here? Uh, yes. Oh, here. Hi. Hey. I like your hat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, hearing you, I was um, I, a thought come to my mind, and I was thinking that uh, certainly when we work in citizen-led initiatives, the biggest limitation is always the sustainability. And I just wanted to ask you, like, what are your insights related to how to scale up? these small initiatives into long-term solutions, long-term solutions that actually reflect on, on services provision and institutionality, like mm -hmm, long-term mm -hmm. solutions with, with that includes the system itself. Because in a lot of countries, especially in contexts where 
mental health services are really scarce and even going even carry on a program with uh, that somehow tackles mental health is really difficult because at the same time you are trying to integrate integrate something but you need to support uh, the people that you are working with of course so, yeah yeah i just went to here it's taking care of the carrier right thank you yeah. i knew that you have beautiful questions i knew it um so two things here i am um, scaling a problem that's a huge problem, especially with uh, micro and meso level interventions. Um, this is what I think that some interventions should be actually upstream. And this is what I was sharing these two uh, um, interventions from England and the UK, Bite Back and, and True Initiatives. I also share with you this um, protest, the, the report from the UNICEF. Well, you have many. Right, and others really addressing things up level. The idea would be that we really mm, mm, make it happen to transform structures and systems. So perhaps not so much scaling up, um, but actually changing the macro structure. And that's, of course, easier said than done. When you talk about scaling up interventions, it's a bit like, okay, how can a micro intervention that is working uh, to, for example, the case of Emily Unity? This multicultural mental health services, how a beautiful idea, by the way. It's like, how can we mainstream that? How can um, there, something that I am not very good at, but I think is pretty key, is that from the start, to enter a conversation with key stakeholders so that they are on board from the start. And there is something uh, in Denmark that worked very well, the ABC program. It's a universal um, health promotion, mental health promotion program. And they've been very wise engaging the municipalities, the healthcare services, the politicians, while they were designing. So not only youth citizen knowledge, but policy makers as well. Like uh, in the pyramid with the tacit and the explicit knowledge. Um, the problem with that, it takes longer time. Politicians also change policymaker to a lesser extent. But this is what I learned from my mistakes. I had a slide with all my lessons learned. <laughs> there are many. But I would say from the start, try to talk to the right people. There are connectors, there are amplifiers, there are very strategic persons that should be involved from the start if you want to scale up. Thank you. Uh, hello. Hola. Hola. Um, Thank you so much for the, the presentation. I, I worked in the past year with many young people who were queer in schools, specifically on combating absenteeism. Mm. Um, so uh, being such an important stakeholder, um, as far as educators, education, administration of schools, um, in, in the U.S., for example, there, there's a, a specific cap um, of classes that you can miss. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of pushback against anything that would allow students to um, have an extended absence. Um, is that is that what you found in? I'm, I'm guessing these are high school age students. I'm not exactly yeah. sure. Um, it, did you find that in Denmark it was hard? It's it's been there's been pushback from that type of education stakeholder towards the the students and um, yeah and 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 if so, how how would you combat that? Yeah, I'm. Um... So the, the thing is that they were sharing, of course, I mean, if you live with depression and if you live with a chronic anxiety, some days you just cannot go to school. You just, but they say we can follow online if possible. That was a possibility, of course, that for them was great during the pandemic. This, this uh, hybrid, well, it was not hybrid, it was fully online, but it's like, why don't we go hybrid? And schools in Denmark, they don't allow that possibility any longer. So what you're sharing is great. I mean, it seems that in US, at least in the work that you did, that was a possibility. Because the risk is that if you don't give that flexibility, then, then there are dropouts. And then it's of course, the vulnerable populations that are at higher risk of dropouts and then they become even more vulnerable. So yes, I, re I really would like to hear about your experience because I think that in Denmark, there is a long way to go to, to allow that. And of course, the thing is that Denmark is a very egalitarian country. And some um, uh, schools would go for that. It's like, yes, we would love to do that. But it has to be the whole country at, time, at the same time. The, the, the public school in Denmark is very homogeneous. So if you make a change at that 
level in one school, it has to go for all schools. That takes a, a while, right? Does it make a, yeah, thank you, yes. Hi, yes, I think I'm next. Hey. Um, thank you so much for being here and for your insightful talk. You mentioned something about uh, burnout and I know that that's a huge issue in general with encouraging um, young people that are very involved in their decisions, but also battling with mental health. So in light of politicians or school board, you further encouraging these youth to continue their fight because also coming from the U.S., there is a huge conservative wave against having these conversations, take away the labels, take away making this mandatory for everyone to learn about. So how are you empowering the youth to not give up or find new avenues to not be discouraged? Managing up. I think that we really, I mean, leaders, it, it is some of us are leaders and some of us are not. And some people have this drive, but I think that we have to change that in a way. I mean, even though I showed the one young uh, world with a lot of leaders and they have really created a lot of fantastic initiatives, I really think that we should um, step some away from that approach of leadership and create community. So it's the community lifting up change or transforming and, and creating new changes. I, I am in our group, for example, I would talk about the experience that we have. There are seven and it's so easy to see that there are two leaders. They're always uh, uh, proposing new things. They are always the ones saying, I want to do it. And I am, I don't want to interfere because one of my rules is no interference, right? They, they, but sometimes it's like invite them to see, hey, why don't you take a break now? And why don't we go for you supporting these? So really, even if they want, I'm aware that number one, they are young, they have their own lives. They have a lot of things to do. And number two, they are living with a chronic condition, chronic mental condition. So I really try to take care of them as well, like Aida was mentioning, uh, to avoid the burnout. Yeah, thank you. Hi. <laughs> hey, yeah, hola, ciao. It's easy, ciao. Um, yeah, so I was just thinking, we know the mental health is, a, is basically a field that many times like creates the norm. We know the, what is, what is it to not be mentally ill? Because um, we know that mental health is basically creating this standard, this uh, norm. Um, so we know what is it normal as you were opening up the speech, like just in relation to uh, the opposite. And we've seen it also like in the history, how like mental health categories, but also illnesses were defined and codified. Um, we know homosexuality wasn't legal until a few years ago uh, or was classified as, um, um, as a mental health uh, disorder and the list goes on. And I like the way like multicultural, um, like mental health kind of like challenges this um, kind of like neoliberal capitalistic way of seeing mental health where mental health is super individualistic and, and all of that. But I kind of like think that I'm, and also Alessia was mentioning, how do we like translate like mental health knowledge like and mental health um, um, categories across cultures. Um, and I see that as being very like hard, especially when the field is still very biomedical. Uh, and a critique that I had was like, how how can we actually, because we want to like step back from the individualization of mental health, where a person struggling with mental health has needs to have the capability of like recognizing and looking for support. And now we're like always saying, okay, people struggling with mental health have to be included. But many times it's the systems, it's the societies that are placing the, these people and boxing and categorizing them. So it's like, how can we find approaches that are not like, um, they are not either like bottom up or top down, but they're actually um, like horizontal in the way that people are not, don't feel the burden to like have to tackle with their mental health issues and then also be part of projects where they have to help others. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. It makes so much it's, sense. It's, it makes sense. Like, Thank you so much. Yeah. And I fully agree with you. We have a, I want to go back to Ivan Illich, medical nemesis. We really have to stop 
um, giving acronyms to young people, ADHD, uh, OCD. Or, I mean, it's like how, how many diagnoses? And I'm, I'm, with the interviews and the discussions that we have with young people, for some it helps, but for some it, 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 it doesn't. All these, you have this and this and this and this and this and that. And it's like you have to, to take this and this and this and this medicine. That's really not sustainable. Also, an antipsychotic medita medication is a heavy medication. I work with with a clinical pharmacist. It's heavy. It is really heavy. And of course, young people they don't like to engage in that. Um, so one thing is okay. A healthcare system. We have to do something about this. Uh, you have to make sure that we are not really harming more than doing good. That would be one thing. But that's almost like an emergency <laughs> reaction, I would say. Um, another thing that I believe in, it's upstream uh, initiatives. So changing the, 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 uh, the structure, the commer addressing commercial determinants of health, addressing issues like, but what I think is, is tough for young people is to feel that they, they have the protest, they have the energy, they want to change things, and then politicians, they don't echo them. That's really disencouraging, right? That they don't see changes happening. And well, we all remember, remember Greta Thunberg, how dare you talk. Um, so, so it's, it's um, something that I am very happy for youth-led youth interventions, but I also think that not everything should be like, youth people is your responsibility, go for it. Go for changing commercial determinants. Go for changing the midstream uh, um, with midstream. I mean, what about me? What about adults? It's everybody's endeavor. This is not a joke. It's many adults. I mean, it's, it's, it's many millions. And it's, it is the future and it's the present and it's, it's everybody, right? So it's also thinking, okay, youth-led intervention, but adults-led interventions at all levels, at all levels. That's what I would like where it's going to happen. I don't know, but I don't think that... Um, and I'm cautious sometimes when I present these youth-led interventions because it's about, and, and, and one of the things that I really don't like about One Young World is like, you are the generation who cannot fail. It's in your hands. Da, da, da. It's like, no pressure, you know? It's like, what about your hands, right? So it's also about adults doing something, I would say. Okay, well, this will be your final word. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> We can talk more. We well, talk more. thank you for this very interesting uh, presentation. Look. Alors, et euh, je vous rappelle que mardi, mardi 10 septembre, il y aura un nouveau webinaire passé l'été du mardi de l'EHESP, cette fois euh, totalement à distance comme d'habitude, et qui sera sur un sujet qui fait écho à ce dont nous venons de parler les déterminants commerciaux de la santé, mais centrés plus sur les industries agroalimentaires. Donc, euh, et ça sera Mélissa Mialon, qui est titulaire d'une chaire junior à INSERM, euh, ici à l'EHESP. Donc, have a nice end of your academic year, you guys. Et bon été à tout le monde. Et on se retrouve le mardi 10 septembre pour le prochain euh, webinaire de l'EHESP. Merci et bon après-midi.